Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We have two outstanding poets with us today, Dorothy Baresi and Jan Wesley. Dorothy will read first and then Jan. Dorothy Baresi is the author of five books of poetry, What We Did While We Made More Guns, University of Pittsburgh, 2018, American Fanatics, Rouge Pulp, The Post-Rapture Diner, winner of an American Book Award, and all of the above. She is the recipient of two push cart prizes and fellowships from the NEA and the Fine Arts Workshop in Provincetown. Her essays and poems have been widely published in national literary journals. She is a newly retired professor of English and creative writing, having taught for 35 years at California State University, Northridge, my alma mater. <laughs> Here's a brilliant poet, Dorothy Baresi. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. Um, thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for pairing me with Jan, who I adore and whose work I love. Thank you so, so much. Um, uh, indeed, I am a new retiree, so I feel like going like this, right? You know, <laughs> I won. <laughs> I'm going to start with uh, some poems about um, the Exide Technologies environmental disaster that's taken place in uh, East Los Angeles. Um, uh, Exide Technologies was a um, battery smelting plant. And um, it uh, operated sort of semi-permitted uh, uh, for many years, and um, it uh, proceeded uh, to uh, spread lead contamination and arsenic contamination uh, uh, throughout uh, seven uh, neighborhoods nearby. And um, they, uh, the neighborhoods are still not uh, reclaimed, so to speak. Um, though the company uh, declared bankruptcy in 2016. So it's an ongoing sort of debacle, if you will. <clears throat> the first poem is called Given To. And in the poems I'm going to read, it's sort of a chapbook I've been working on about Exide. In the poems I'm going to read, um, they take uh, different perspectives, workers, uh, residents, uh, lawyers, etc. Given To. Exide battery recycling plant contaminates 10,000 homes in poorest Los Angeles neighborhoods. Nets no jail time. That's from the LA Times. If you are lucky in this life, only two or three people will hate you for cause. Given to leukemia, asthma, lung cancer, developmental delays, certainly a sweeping category. Given to the sensation of falling while seated or on landings. Nosebleeds, soft bones, premonitions, <clears throat> excuse me, sores on the tongue, on the roof of the mouth, a membranous call or grit skin, damage as relates to the pleasure of distinguishing sweet from sour. Think of your front yard as a needle. Think of your daughter as an addict in her sandbox. Brain cancer, renal leakage, across the viscous gel of the eye, a faint floating, illegible scrawl, un scrawl, untranslatable as vision, edema, joint pain, reading delays, blood cancer, mets to the bone, <clears throat> peripheral distortions, who or what is almost seen at the small corners requires guesswork. Higher infant mortality rates, consistent with per capita income. Correlation is not causation, Excite Technology states, for the deposition given to. Smelting is a 19th century word involving tremendous heat and commerce. It goes far back. Today, a car battery smelter remakes what can be used to represent a savings, but Chinese factories are where the real margins hold. Everything else is byproduct. Lead dust in the groundwater, arsenic spores, whiff of tar gas in remedial classrooms exceeding 80 parts per million, and a light vertical static of industrial concern, Fidelis ed mortem. 285 homes cleaned so far. 
Message in the mirror, you are a vanquished enterprise. The machine may be simple or complex, but it goes. This is a section from the poem where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. It's from Mark 944. Since the miscarriage, something unsleeping in your frayed hearing, night's white tinnitus from the furnaces blaring Sundays too into your pillow, a million lead batteries melted down all day, all night, so that you with your need to eat can sift bits of plastic from superheated reclamation. Poison takes many forms, abides by its own last steps. Will you make line supervisor finally? In any case, you strap your swamped dissolving sneakers together with electrical tape. Where the worm dieth not, etc. One night you dream you swallow several human teeth. It isn't clear whose teeth or why you've taken them in. Are they folk medicine or honorific seeds? Punishment or affliction? Should you try to bring them up from your belly by violence, ipecac, or pay a dull lure the color of silver fillings down your throat to hook them back? Time slips through your fingers like milk money. You grow younger, you have never been so tired. Should you let your body play these rough dice with two roots each and make of bleeding what it will? Pearl into grit, unmiraculous. In any case, nothing happens. You wake yourself still waiting. Rhetorical positions one and two, causation versus correlation. The phrase stillborn cuts all ways, containing and releasing that which is still rigor, unmoving, and so at a mortis end, and that which still must be born is torment by the mother every day, the unbearable, still crowning natal death of movement. Correlation is not causation, in which the client hopes to clarify the relationship between elevated lead concentrates in the drinking water and jurisdictional pregnancies. A miscarried child is a child only in the sense that it fails to attach itself convincingly to the uterine lining. Somewhere along the line, it just lets go. Regarding a stillborn child, we must demur, saying, still, it was born albeit still. Coming, going to term. One, the intimacy of ordinary conduct builds a child from blood, breath, soul, bone, clumsy honesty, bad lines of credit, sweet glory, etc. Now this child, a fetus completely blind, must recognize her temporary home instantly and latch on for dear life, as we sometimes say. Naturally, we would not accuse a child, revenant of error, who lets go of lacking devotion. Lawyers representing residents argue that grasping of a different sort resides at the heart of the company's new bankruptcy bid and that its disaster capitalism seems to tighten even as the spectacle of ill-dividing cells grows. Two, grief is a devotion at home in us, soundlessly turning, turning its keys somewhere below the breastbone. And grief is not a place for agony to be solved. There is no act so grave one forfeits citizenship there without capital or account. Because the, technolo because the Exide Technologies bankruptcy is not stayed. It is official. Exide Technologies, henceforth, henceforth referred to simply as blank, ceases to exist as business furnace and runnel of lead proud, history-denying history concern now formally dissolved into parkway, waterway, backyard, lobe, and alveoli, blood breath, 
nerve sway, fetal sac, all the crossings over. Only daydreaming could have settled the dust quicker. Blank is gone. We can curse the unforgivable by its given name no longer. It has been released from deep time and the near spiritual materiality of language, or we ourselves have been released from all inferences contained therein, specifically no responsibility for past, present, future miscarriages, stillbirths, blood cancer deaths, renal cancer, developmental delays, et cetera, et cetera, may attach itself to the culprit we once knew going forward. No, the dead must go where they will now, unaccompanied, still and still. And still. This poem is just called Poem. Um, nerve bracked, wave form, fetal sac, breath of dust on a Tuesday AM, too goddamn hot for the season. Via air's least glance and runnel of lead. Under root raised sidewalks, broken curbs, shifting particulate matter into lobe and nerve bracked, waveform, tax breath. Everything carried on delicate nursery folds of wind and footfall into your human hastening. And blank, formerly exide, formally released from all future care and cleaning. Imagine being released from the consequences of your worst sin. Bodies are like that, always being taken or taking in. This is the last. Oh, no, I'm not going to read that. Sorry, <laughs> I scrubbed that from the list. Um, I'm going to turn now to a, a poem. That's a little bit, uh, uh, you know, 90 degree turn, but but maybe not as well, because I sort of uh, am obsessed with uh, at times with motherhood um, and um, and in those exile poems that I read, I sort of kept um, pregnancy and miscarriage and motherhood sort of at the center. Um, I want to read today for the first time because it's brand new. Um, a long poem called The Sea of Galilee, and it's in seven numbered parts. Um, and um, it, uh, as you will see, roams around a bit um, and is at places a little theatrical. <laughs> Not that I would ever accuse myself of being theatrical, of course, but um, I, <laughs> um, I, I, I hope this all works out because, as I said, this is the first time I'm, I'm reading this. The Sea of Galilee. One, from every heaven, the view is the same. The night my son Dante came out to me, he was perfectly nonchalantly himself. You know I'm not the straightest guy in the world. Eyes on his screen, smiling because he was home early for Christmas break, comedically jazzing the last term paper, two paragraphs to go on neutrinos or the economics of scale or the post-industrial processes of the soil. And more, it seemed to me, alive in his achieved body than any stuttering theologian or breakable God destined to be held up by three nails in one of those binding rituals exported from the defeated kingdoms of men. Yes, it was a good night. He was his own and whole, the night air good in our lungs, the serried firs bowing at the window's beck and call, something scratching at the glass. Thank you, I said. I'm honored, I said. Two. Did we become human gradually or all at once? The question is posed on a podcast I half hear driving home from yet another routine cancer screening that promises light lingering discomfort, along with unirretrievable memories of my mother's last dispatch, 
through the blind turns, the bone shrill death instruction she was chosen to receive, quieted only by the morphine line's light click. Then the whispering to herself, secrets, or else she was speaking directly to the annulling dusk in its own language, without fury or dismay, or the melancholy requirements of capitulation. Her breath, I remember, was mysterious, human smelling, like rich soil. But when I put my ear close to her lips, I could not make her out. Later, between bouts of online shopping, I look up human becoming. I am forever looking things up later to discover anthropologists posit skull size as slow revelation, our incremental, measurable, extremely hard, future-facing history. Believers, on the other hand, hold that humanness displays itself instantly in the moment the difference between our soul's cost and its actual value is revealed a sacred bafflement, late December's star-crossed bargain we did not strike, but somehow bear, having never fully understood the terms of our engagement. Three, boys are falling behind, the New Yorker says, not just in math, science, reading, but outperformed as a matter of course, three to one, by eager, by eager girls hunched over desktops, speeding number two pencils across fresh, unlined realities, graduating from college at twice the rate of men, decades now, as a matter of course. And a certain segment of these men keep falling further and further behind parity, provoking social scientists to advance an array of culprits, technology, outsourcing, America's culture-wide shift from brawn to brains, or maybe, they muse, maybe blame lies not with the muscular, much lamented death of manufacturing, but with feminism's only partially unintended and wholly unexpected success in breaking the imperviousness of masculine self-belief in just a little over a hundred years. Regardless of cause, experts agree, fatal histories are being made and measured in upticks, upticks, rage drinking, overdose deaths, suicide or suicidal ideation, homicidal ambition, a hardening of racial and gender hatreds, no matter how grotesque or desperate or desolating, combined with the swallowing of falsehoods whole, along with daily pain meds. Indeed, a growing number of men are leaving the workforce permanently in their 40s or 50s to play video games and conduct seething online research instead. Four, priests talk to gods, gods to shamans, shamans to the earth. Still, the left hand is always there to ready the claiming hand, the right. I'll take him apart, I say to my son. Point him out to me, the little fucker. I mean it. I will take him apart. In December, love perforce decrees we buy presents separately, then reunite in the food court of a throbbing retail space lit like a temple for the apocal rites of money changing hands for goods and services. Target to Louis Vuitton, Tiffany to Limited Express, and for the 10,000 voices of shoppers to be moved like capillary blood closer to the surface of our purchasing power, our heat and our glee, Chanel to Dix, Macy's to drab, exquisite Burberry. One miracle costs one parking spot. Contentment has no enthronement ceremonies planned for us today, but there are ziggurats of pastel gelato sweating under double pane safety glass and garlic ribeye at the churrascaria, skewered into long lines for 15 bucks. Long lines, not a seat anywhere. Five, which boy, I say again. Jesus, mom, Dante says, forget it, I shouldn't have told you. He lofts a box of etched whiskey glasses he's bought for his boss over the heads of the coursing Carol Mad Mom. I mean, what he says, you're going to beat up a 13-year-old kid for calling me a faggot when he's just showing off for his friends. Then unsteady laughter. Believe me, I've been called worse. 
then quieter. I have to make myself taller, lean close to his words. He's worried they'll uncover some hidden weakness and kill him for it by study hall. Some of the gifts we bought that day were not returned. Or should I be honest for once and say, this is fear. I made it in my body. Six. When those tiki Nazi bastards chanted, Jews will not replace us in Virginia, state name for the bespoke virgin who must have died when she heard her son with his crew made water walkable during their epic hang at the Sea of Galilee, being altogether boys. Show-offs, really, given God's flair for boom. I thought of Mary and the role she'd been forced to play as First Testament girl, made mother by non-consensual ghost sex. And I worried not for the first time that she'd likely divined long before her oldest son's last upward glance of agony and tortured capitulation to the absent father, what his fate would cost her every second of every day until her own death came due, which brought me back to Virginia and those acneed, sexless creeps in khakis, those bad readers and discount conspiracy droolers, racist future wearers of adult diapers. Did one of their mothers, hearing later what her son had done, take a soft sip of her jewel and trembling whisper, forgive him, for he knows not what he does? The working definition of hope a way to go on despite the truth. Seven, somewhere I read, I read to forget it seems, that the biblical city of Galilee once boasted roving bandit gangs who would kill you as soon as look at you. Phrase invented to keep our eyes lowered, boom. Now it's crawling with those all-inclusive beach resorts so popular with honeymooners. And I think I'm going to end there. Thank you very much. I only stumbled a few times. Thank you. But thank you, Dorothy, for such a marvelous reading. You have such a great mind. You're socially conscious and intellectually conscious, and you really... Uh, you know, you look at the world, and you're not just a personal poet, but you do bring the personal into it. What? Uh, when did you write your first poem? Um, I had the tremendous good fortune of um, taking a poetry class at the University of Akron. Uh, my dad taught there, so we all got to go for free. So very exciting. <laughs> so during my undergraduate years, um, I think I was maybe 18 um uh i uh i took a poetry class with a great poet named elton glazer and um i think by my third poem for the class um he said something like where did this come from <laughs> you know <laughs> and i said i i don't know um uh and he was kind of like well keep doing it <laughs> so uh, that was that was the beginning and i owe so much to all uh, all my teachers uh, when I was in school who all helped me m- make my way. You know, I was you very have such, You have such great narrative strength. And what what is it about the poetry form that attracts you to it? You know, that's a great question, because in my uh, younger years, I thought, oh, I'm going to become a fiction writer before I took my first poetry class. That's what I I sort of thought I would want to do. And when I took poetry um, and we were reading amazing contemporary poets in that class, and I don't know, it was just like, you know, to use a biblical reference, the scales fell from my eyes or something. I just, I love the musicality of it. I love the um, use of of, uh, metaphor and simile, imagery. I just fell in love with the, uh, the emotionality you know, packed into that music. I don't know. It just, it just, it just delivered on some like deep level. And, uh, you know, so I've been hooked ever, ever since. Who are some of the poets who influenced you before you began writing in a serious, regular way? 
when when I was um, just starting out, I I, my, I have my first book of poetry that anybody gave me, which was Lawrence Ferlinghetti's A Coney Island of the Mind, I think it is. So I, I dug that. But um, I think in the beginning, I was knocked out by uh, the deep image poets, um, uh, James Wright, uh, Robert Bly, um, uh, W.S. Merwin, um, I just, I, uh, Galway Canal, I just love, uh, their narrative line, but also those moments of, of kind of, um, uh, sort of soul resonance or something like that. Um, Wright says at the end of his poem, A Blessing, if I could step out of my body, I would break into blossom, that kind of thing. I just, you know, I was just, just in the beginning, just that's, that's what, that's what carried me. Um, and unfortunately, I just named all men. I apologize for that. But that was sort of, so I should say also Sylvia Plath, Ann Sexton, uh, Denise Levertov, Maxine Kuhlman as well. I love all of those poets. I love uh, Ann Sexton of all the poets, uh, Ann Sexton, Sylvia Plath and Adrian Rich. They're all great. Adrian Rich. But I love uh, what well, she reclaimed poetry for language for women, obviously. But I yes. love Anne Sexton. She's she's my favorite. Those one and two syllable words, and she just uh, she's just fabulous. What uh, the last question? Uh, uh, when you sit down to write a poem, do you begin with an idea, an image, emotion, words? What is it that you know kicks off a poem for you? You know, I um, I sort of go at it in different different ways, but oftentimes. Um, I'm not typically a person who can just sit down and just start knocking something out. So I'll, um, I have language journals, uh, which I collect language phrases, uh, title ideas, poem ideas, quotations, etc. cetera. And, um, and sometimes I will, uh, do a little, I'll, I'll put some of that language down on some paper, literally sort of write it out and then sit down to my computer and sort of play around with bringing something unexpected together. Sometimes it's a title that I start with, um, um, though I haven't really sort of formulated exactly what I want. I think I like better going into a poem, not exactly knowing where it's going to take me. So if I use, you know, if I, if I can look at some language journals and sort of collect some language that way, just sort of, um, almost, um, almost create a collage in a sense of, of language and then sort of go from there into, you know, meaning or whatever that, that works better for me. I think I'm, I'm not very good at just sitting down and writing, uh, from, from topic. Cause I, I think that kind of, it, it I feel dull uh, in that, in that mode. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm sort of a collector of language. So I, I use that. I turn to that. To, to get me going. Might be called a star, cro star cross bargains that you get every once in a while to use one of your phrases. That's right. Exactly. Exactly. And I think that poetry, the making of poetry is, is mysterious and, and mystical in its own way. And, um, you know, we call language to the poem. <laughs> uh, we don't always know what's going to happen, but, uh, uh, but we, we call, call language, you know. But thank you for your great poetry, and you have such a great mind. And you know, I, I studied you. poetry with Anne Stanford, as you know, and I I envy the students who studied with you. You're so eloquent and erudite. So thank, thank you so you. much, Dorothy. A pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so so much. And I was I was very honored uh, to be here, and honored to. Um, be hired after Ann Stanford's passing. So thank you for at CSUN. So thank you for, for reminding me of that. Thank you. And our next poet is Jan Wesley. Jan Wesley's second poetry book titled Only So Much came out last year from What Books Press. She has another full-length book titled Living in Freefall and two published chapbooks. Her poems have appeared in various journals, including Askew Magazine, Blue Mountain Review, the Iowa Review, and Spillway. She has an MFA from Vermont College, received a pushcart nomination, taught poetry at Redlands University, and writing classes at the Fashion Institute 
of design and merchandising in downtown Los Angeles. She worked for years in the film business and post-production for feature films and television. She now teaches writing workshops and is developing a book of poems with visual materials. Here's a superb poet, Jan Wesley. Thank you, Harry. Uh, Dorothy, being able to read with you is a highlight of my poetry career. Uh, you write about the world in a way that has been inspiring to me for a long time. Uh, uh, you know, I'm a big fan. <laughs> um, and Harry, thank you so much. This is a great poetry series and, of course, a uh, real honor to be here. I'm just going to read straight through. I guess the only thing uh, I would like to say is um, uh, probably about 50 percent now of my poems are prose poems, uh, narrative in a block. Uh, looking like prose rather than the lines of, of po you know, the way a poetry is lineated. After Raymond Carver at midnight, the darkness felt like a hood and the moon fell behind a cloud. So I turned on the light over my side of the bed quietly as if the added illumination made noise. He was almost snoring, and I swallowed jealousy of how he could sleep through earthquakes and the revving, screeching, illegal, souped-up auto racers on a shortcut boulevard below the house. We had been drinking scotch on the patio until loping to bed to be able to get up for work, and he drifted off to sleep quickly, so I hung up my clothes and spotted my flesh with face cream from a a company in Germany swearing I'll look a hundred years younger for another hundred years. He seemed to dream we would that I'm sorry, he seemed to dream he would leave the two of us and head out like a camel across a desert, knees flexible, leisurely in their gait, knowing how to save water, understanding distance. I carried on reading a story about couples who drank voracious amounts of liquor, making me abandon the book, slide a marker in it, set it down quietly on the table as if the hush of pages might wake him. I tried thinking of the best things we had done that week to make me feel lazy and bring on sleep. The silkiness of the sheets was soothing, relaxation, sending my leg to touch his out of habit remembrance of the final things he'd said and to have the last word he makes the end game point by saying it's like that emphasis on that I was bagged under the eyes when the sun hit the house like a laser when he walked to me half naked in runner shorts and kissed my head hand grazing the top of my back as he pulled away said like that baby it's like that my weariness was too deep and day too long to ask him what's like what to tell him for the 96th time to stop calling me baby. Atmospheric rivers. Electricity hums after the rains in this deviant winter drilled by jackhammers of wind and chill that fire tiny needles at the eyes. Avalanches of water change into snow on distant peaks to meet a glistening horizon and a blimp, airship of quiet crews as it glides over celebrations of the new year. Snow slammed onto mountains melts at the wrong time of year, landslides inviting themselves into homes, forecasters bemoaning the unrestrained cold, our bodies tossed under comforters, feet in socks on streets of hardwood floors. It should be eggs, but I sit with a basket of pastries to soothe the fear, sweeten the dread. Walls of windows peeking onto a hawk enviable in its flight. A week of downpour digging ditches and filling up empty riverbeds. When the sky clears itself of overcast, I wander in the smell of the aftermath of rain. 
an age, old age relief that feels like the touch of a lover's skin. The temperature is spiky, and I care for others better than I do for myself and wonder if sacrifice will get me into a heaven I don't believe in. Magic hour light sits in a glow that spurs me into a sprint, but my legs stop short where a coyote stares at me, gazing back at him. I speak as if we were friends and say, the hills will dry now, you will find food as he comes close enough to lick my hand until we remember who we are. He turns into a neighbor's grassland, and I make my way to the end of the road, certain the weight to rectify life can save ours, can save mine, an urgency to promise, yes, I will drop seeds for peonies and maple trees, but really what I'll do is rise over the earth to see what is buried under a field that isn't meant to be a field. In my solitude, sun rays have just begun to fall across a corner of the terrace where I sit with coffee and her new book I envy and hate to feel that way vengeful like unyielding scratch of na nails down an arm so I kick myself for it. But it's a good book and deserves the glory it gets. I lean against the railing seven floors above a park along a side street where looking down inspires restraint and I back off from tipping into space toward the ground, its certainty unforgiving. It seems to be sunset. The heat of August winding down in this holy time of the fight to do what the body wants instead of what the body gives into. There is a field of green grass in the park that stays open to people without homes and nurturing trees have shade. Their bodies slow across the grass, searching to settle themselves under different trees as weakening light moves around the sky. Men and women we avoid, the people we never get to know, sit in their jackets and their minds are whittled, flimsy plastic bags stuffed with all they own. From inside the house, I hear a jazz singer float a song and I breathe in my solitude, the book tapping on my thighs, she speaks only to me. And I sit with her, ablaze in the story, so hot to the touch. This poem is, uh, I just want to say, inspired by Dorothy, her fabulous book called, I have to look at it, What We Did While We Made More Guns. A great book, along with all our others, not including the animals. A boy picks up a gun his father gave him, and the father takes his son to a field where they shoot bullets ten in a row into a peach can, lined up and pelted until nothing is left but holes. And by the time the kid grows enough to make the gun his own, he likes the squeeze and praises the holy miracle of distance and speed to kill things. Only in case there is need to eliminate impending threat to his own family, but soon they grow so large he needs another gun in case a stranger invades to keep his wife and children and dogs alive. So maybe a gun for each person he has to save is the best advice. But when there is a sound, perhaps animals raiding the yard, the man fires at another man standing beneath his tree, waving his gardening glove to flick away flies. And like a shot, he is dead and falls. And the shooter tosses his gun and cries, it was an accident almost certain to happen with 400 million guns in a country of 300 million people. 
Or maybe sometimes a person is jilted or scorned. A tussle between brother and sister and a dinner might be burned in the oven and without thought, another person is dead. But someone tells Shooter of a Second Amendment's right to bear arms. So somehow a jury agrees there was a threat to property and self-defense it is. And people get angrier, too. Many outsiders living too close to homes owned by men, women, kids with excess guns, with fears of losing the right to blah, 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 getting them to buy more guns at stores that know how many guns can be sold and how they ship faster than light bulbs. And soon new fathers pass guns down to younger sons and some billy bully boy picks up a gun to scare anyone who crosses the line. And soon 45,000, give or take 100, are killed. But maybe on a rainy day when sight is in doubt and on that day when no one is on the gun range, perhaps a wounded survivor sees something new besides his gun and says, maybe it's time to cease the fire. A sudden wonder in this land of the free, sudden curiosity of why in God's name we kill 100 someone's loved ones a day. How things happen, we never see. When I was a kid, I never had to go with other kids to church. My father always in a dither and declaring there is no God because how can we be at war? How can we languish in such neglect? My face was sunk into books or I stared out the laundry room being helper and pest while I waited for the kids to race home from their pews. And some days I slept late. And one of those days, my mother was gone, just like that. I went from worry to knowing she was dead always. And to this day, feeling lucky. I didn't find her there in their bed, her face unlikely pale, pinned to a view of the ceiling or falling to the side. I never saw where her hands had settled, where her athletic legs were frozen under the sheet. I hadn't grown enough imagination to see how my father approached her, what startled sounds came out of his mouth, how he bent to her, and if he knew right away, or if he tried to wake her, or if he held her, or took her hand, or if the sun slithered through the backyard window into the room. Perhaps inertia woke him as he slept beside her on that Sunday I got up late, ignoring my chores and giving up patience to wait for the boys. A haze like the blanch of my skin crept through summer, autumn, all the years. On this day of rest, I leave the bed as the living plants show off red blooms and the cat lifts his head, arching, watching to see that nothing raids our peace, knowing that if I sedated my vigilance, perhaps we could sleep until noon. Walking the dogs, Cassandra. The assault of summer Texas birds screeches like machines where she wanders into shade under the oak tree stamped into the succulent lawn where a wood seated swing rocks without a child in it hanging over beds of flowers along a lawn of bas relief grass. When night shimmers against its outer space of stars and the horizon is flat like a pencil line, she and I will crawl into an anarchy of jacuzzi jets with our heads dropped against the edges of the tub in the yard where fruit trees lose their bounty, each body surrendered to water that will stay only slightly hotter than the air. 
Inside, I gather dishes from breakfast and let them soak in the sink, nab leashes off a hook next to the cedar-studded door, and two dogs waggle up, tails whipping, eyes at a standstill, staring as if my face is done up in raw beef. I hook two leashes to their collars before I call out with a mother's words, let's go, and eight canine legs drag me outside to my friend where she plucks fried petals off the salvia bush. The dogs pull like oxen and I stumble against her as my foot catches a sycamore root, visceral reminder of how we rose out of the dark in those terrible years. She holds a treat above the dogs, wagging like flaps of sheet metal in a wind, the duo postponing their lurch toward the street where they will sniff every bush, every discard of daily life. But for this divine moment, they sink into immaculate pause like deadlocked cars, ready to catch the toss of foamy treats designed to clean their teeth as they feed them, as if everything we love can do everything. This is to a woman who died a year ago in October. And this is for Chuck. Bernadette, to the tune of Bernadette, she was a legend when we met, my friend charming my hand to take Bernadette's hand outstretched from her body that leaned and swayed at six feet tall as she bent a bit to greet me and we sang our names under a vengeance of the drought. Tonight she claims she is ready and asks for ice chips rather than morphine. Her weary head seems fortified, but her long neck gives way. Her beautiful face curved to her chest as though she may be scheming her way out of this. But let me tell you the good stuff and where she gathers up flowers to sink in water under the faucet that feeds them. At the end of the cul-de-sac is a crossroad with the Elfin Forest boardwalk slicing a slinky trail through pygmy oaks, sagebrush, manzanita, foxtails, everlasting pinks, gooseberry, everything she touched. Her dogs yanking their leashes, aromas making them shimmy and nettle and cattails coming home in a sheen from the bay, diffusing her silhouette into a mist. Our shoes ground dirt into kitchen tile as we clicked stems from spinach leaves, and I could see how she will always be in love with him as she brushed his arm, gliding past breadboard to lettuce spinner, his hand shaking a pail, shaking a pan of oil on the stove. Her deep brown hair tumbled then, quiet water down her back, unlike the tight cap it's been shaved to by medicine thin now as crepe paper. The room crowds with people from childhood, her cousins from France, one by one, our hips settling on the bed to sit with her. I really relive jaunts in town where we left the street to enter shops, everyone repeating greetings with Bernadette, holding out their hands to clasp hers like all of us do now. He kisses her, and with a devotional wink, she smiles past pain, feeling the dream of best laid plans changed, the way balm becomes gunfire. She asks if he might rearrange the room so everyone will have chairs around the bed as if aligned to unearth stories, and of course we do. The air moves her chest, her limbs narrow as rope, vision sleepy and drifting to the love he shows. And she would love to show her love, too, if only she could reclaim her beautiful body. If only flexed at the waist to fondle tulips, newly open like a window and her hands through his hair. <clears throat> I'll end with this. 
what we mean about the love of a life. I am allergic to coconut and cat hair. When we broke up, he sent me a tuft of orange cat fur and a coconut box label taped to a piece of cardboard jammed into an envelope. It was brilliant. It was art. The last time I saw him, years had gone by, and I walked up behind him where he perused a shelf of CDs, his spine lengthened by taut muscles inside a cotton blend sky blue shirt, and I still knew the sway of his torso, a slight rise in the left shoulder, and I don't remember, but probably gave a good sigh to his ass. A a corduroy pants tight around his legs that always had a savvy instinct to run. When he broke up with me or me unable to give up my pending lifestyle, I didn't imagine I would regret. There was a sense that love would never be the same. The day we met, he leaned back in his chair and its two rear legs and looked at me walking up to him, not giving a shit whether I was stylish or distracted or young or whether he was interested, available or kind. We had been set up for what most people would imagine was a date, but for us, it was all about changing the system. His eyes studied the world and its roaming clans through window-thick glasses with one stem taped to the frame. We lived on a hill choked off by a five-lane boulevard and ethnic restaurants and shops that stayed open late because people had nowhere else to go. We were poor, but not like people who didn't stand a chance. He and I could choose not to make raw deals that would take things out from under us. We could con our way into jobs and make a few bucks for gas and food. Our bodies were shoots pushing up from the dirt. We were lion-hearted. We were limber with we were laden with limberness. We were just beginning. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. What a superlative reading. Your your poetry is personal. It's loving, wise, elegiac, and uh, it's poignant. You know, and you're so hooked up emotionally with your writing, and you see so much. And one of your phrases kind of says that for me, every gift card of daily life, you just see things, and and just such a moving, great reading that you gave along with Dorothy. So. Uh, I want to ask you a couple of questions, the same as I asked Dorothy. When did you write your first poem? Well, I wrote uh, my first poem in a class uh, at CalArts who had a very tough alternative poetry teacher. And uh, boy, you know, he would praise poems that were just rugged with pain and so on and so forth. And I just couldn't write about that stuff yet. So I felt just, uh, I just couldn't stay with it. I was just, you know, upended by this. So it was, I, I was taking, you know, writing journals and I was writing images, walking around with my little notebook. And I just started writing small poems about, what I saw and walked through in life. And I guess the first poem I had to speak out loud was for my wedding. And uh, I just came some poet about four, you know, four sections of, about falling in love and blah, all this stuff, and read it at my wedding. And uh, it, it went really well. People asked to have a copy. And I thought, what? This is just a little you know, journal entry kind of thing. So I got a little serious after that and started, uh, I went into a poetry workshop at the Midnight Special with uh, most people who are in my writing group that I've been in uh, for 24 years and thank them every day uh, for this long work together. And when you start a poem, do you start with an idea, an emotion, images, words? You know, I I never know what's what's going to happen. Uh, I never kind of think of a poem 
uh, as a as a story or as something that has a particular kind of drive toward meaning. Um, so I really, you know, something will come to me at night and I'm learning to speak into my phone because I'll never, you know, remember it in the morning. But often it's just a single line. You know, I am allergic to coconut and cat hair. I don't know. I just said it one day, maybe to somebody else, maybe, you know, because I was having an allergy attack. I, I don't know. And then I try to let image associate with another image. And uh, it's it's what my great poetry teachers have kind of not taught is to uh, not know where you're going. So I, I really write with the association of one image to another. You do a marvelous, I, you do a marvelous job with that. I'm oh, so pleased to have you on the show today. We're just about out, and so yes. I just want to take the time to thank Dorothy Baresi and Jan Wesley for your wonderful reading today. You, you know, you you've lifted me up as as great poetry does, and I always feel a sense of exaltation when I'm able to spend time with excellent poets as both of you are. So thank you very much, uh, and I I would like to announce about next Tuesday's poetry reading. Next Tuesday, we have a program, Poets Talk Movies, with Aram Saroyan, James Cushing, Susan Hayden, S.A. Griffin, Amelie Frank, and Celeste Goyer. So thank you very Great. much. And uh, our, our director, Jennifer Clymer, is going to take us home. So here we are, and... And it's time for the next show. So thank you once again, Dorothy Baresi and Jan Wesley. Thank you.